It's very hard to actually argue that Brexit was something that people actually wanted. You've only got to look at the opinion polls and no one actually cared about Brexit until the whole EU started to, shall we say, talk about um, tax reform and making sure that tax dodgers are, um, well, are, are, are made to pay their, their fair share. Indeed, if you may remember when David Cameron went to negotiate with the EU, um, one of the things that he pushed for was that the UK tax havens be excluded from that. The EU said no. And as a result, we saw, um, again, the Brexiteers love to claim how many people, how many elites supported um, Remain. But just as many, if not more, uh, you know, quote, elites supported Brexit and put significantly more money into trying to get Brexit to be done. Um, the quote has been said before, but uh, never, never has so much damage been done by so few and for so little. Um, you know, that's that sums up Brexit of what it is going to be in a, in a nutshell. And we've talked before about, you know, economics will not be denied. When we leave, our economy will start to go into um, not in complete free fall but we will start to see huge and economic uh, hardships that likes which we haven't seen for quite some time I've already said this on a, on a on a on a timely basis you can time me like a watch but we are in a recession now many other countries have taken a, an equal hit to the coronavirus um, but why are we the only ones who are in a recession what is so special about us being in a recession and it's because of brexit and it, no one really wants to say it because the brexiteers are trying to blame all the damage that brexit has done so far on the coronavirus and that's what that will there will song and dance will be especially um going forward but they won't be able to maintain that um you know the japan deal um is just quite frankly a complete lame duck. Um, it's nowhere near nowhere near uh, how good the the Japan deal we currently have being in the EU, which of course ends officially um, when we properly leave at the end of this year. Um, and that's that's the truth. And one of the things I've I've said is we need a deal um, desperately because of trade gravity. Europe ain't going anywhere, despite the claims of the Brexiteers that it's days away from, from falling. You know, you can, again, they've said that pretty much almost every day for the past 40 years. You can literally create a timeline of Nigel Farage and time and date it of Nigel Farage saying the EU isn't going to be here five years, can go back. The EU isn't going to be here in five years. The EU isn't going to be here in five years continuously. And I would love... Um, for someone to do that because that would be a fantastic video just to show um just how wrong you know these guys are in trying to predict that the eu is going to just fall in five years but it never really has and indeed we've seen that because we weren't there at the recent um the the, the budget negotiations just how easy it was for the eu to to pass stuff because we weren't there to veto it and this is why a lot of Euro, Euro skeptics in uh, in Europe have suddenly gone, oh no, we've lost our biggest play piece. The fact that we knew that uh, the UK was going to veto stuff. Oh no. So that's why you've, uh, you remember last week we talked about an MP Euro skeptic who bizarrely decided to blame the EU for forcing the UK to hold a referendum and then forcing the British public to then vote to leave. But there you go. But anyway, this article comes from uh, an Irish piece, uh, an Irish journal uh, called now. Well, the the, the journal, um, and I presume it's Irish because it's .ie. Uh, but he talks about how Brexit really isn't a one-hit wonder, and that this has been something that's not only been brewing, not only for a long time in the Tory Party, but especially I, I what I would call um, Middle Tory England. And again, these were the people who enthusiastically voted to join um, what was the fledging European Union and were the ones who, you know, overwhelmingly voted to leave. So, as 
As the internal market bill causes more rancor in the Brexit talks, it is no surprise to see that focus of attention for many of the UK has rendered uh, has rendered down to the internal dynamic to, uh, to the internal dynamics of the British Conservative Party. The party that championed its ascension to the ECC in 1973 when the Labour Party opposed such a move has struggled with the European project ever since the days of Margaret Thatcher. The matter has bedeviled every Tory leader since Margaret Thatcher from all sides of the debate with an inability to steady the horses uh, on this lead to the uh, and the lead to the calling of the Brexit referendum in the first place. Thatcher was initially a keen enthusiast for the ECC her campaign in 1975, uh, the referendum on returning uh, in, in the single market, was crucial to ensuring victory. Her famous showdown uh, with, with Jean, uh, Jacques Delors at Brussels set up a schism in the Tory party approach to Europe that continues to this very day. It was Black Wednesday and the departure from the exchange rate mechanism that completely undermined John Major's strength as a, a leader leading uh, bruising battles to pass the, pass the Maastricht Treaty with growing levels of rancour on his own backbenchers. This culminated in Major uh, putting his leadership on the line against John Redwood, whose brand of Euroscepticism uh, Euro continues to pour forth from the very back of the green benches today in Westminster. This parallel uh, to this saw the birth of several Eurosceptic parties, such as the Anti-Federalist League, James Goldsmith Referendum Party, and the infamous UK Independence Party, or UKIP. The demise of Major and the Labour and the Labour landslide victory in 1997 saw the Conservative Party go through three leaders before, before settling with David Cameron in 2005. The Conservative leaders in the interim uh, period all battled internally and argued pointlessly with the question of Europe. William Hague was regarded as being slightly more Eurosceptic than Major, who uh, who was uh, and remains a pro-European, while both Ian Duncan Smith and Michael Howard were full-throated Eurosceptics. Former Chancellor of the Exchequer Ken Clark failed to uh, be elected leader on numerous occasions for his reluctance to downplay his enthusiasm for the European project. And UKIP consistently performed well in European elections, often beating the Tories, although failing to win seats in the House of Commons. And when he was elected leader, David Cameron attempted to lance the European boil by taking the Conservatives out of the EPPED, the group in the European Parliament. This robbed the Conservatives of huge influence as members of the biggest bloc, but was also a psychological shift. Unfortunately, this did little to halt the progress and calm the Eurosceptic tendencies and elements of the Conservative Party, especially when Cameron led the Conservatives into the government with a strong pro-European Liberal Democrats in 2010. Following another European election defeat to UKIP, Cameron promised ahead of the 2015 general election that he would hold a, uh, that he would hold a straight in or out referendum on EU membership. Roll on uh, to the leadership of Theresa May and the negotiations of the UK's departure from the UK, uh, departure, uh, departure, and the UK and various factions of the Conservative Party are clashed again over the nature of what Brexit should look like, soft, hard or compromised. And the farcical scenes of the indicative vote's leadership heaves heavy and the resignations on all sides led to May's departure and the election of Boris Johnson as Prime Minister. The champion of the Eurosceptic wing and someone who had voted leave, Johnson negotiated a withdrawal agreement with the EU identical to the one that May had failed to get through her party the year previous. And roll on less than a year from that, the general election campaign and the subsequent ratification of the withdrawal agreement supported by every Conservative MP currently in the House of Commons and Johnson's government is threatening to renege on the agreement and breach international law. The reaction has been stark. Some Eurosceptics, like the aforementioned Redwood and Duncan Smith, say the move does not go far enough, while arch Brexiteers like Howard and Norman, uh, Norman Lightman say that moves contained within the Internal Market Bill 
go too far and that jeopardise the UK's global standing when it comes to the rule of law. Compromise amendments have already been submitted and reports abound of heavy whipping. Johnson has a majority to get this through the House of Commons with limited opposition, but he will struggle to get it through the House of Lords. Uh, all the while, the EU and many international parties watch on completely aghast. The British government needs to realise that compromise, uh, compromise amendments and sanctions internally mean very little. They should really be focusing on talks with the EU. Michel Barnier and his team wait patiently for the Conservative Party to get over their latest European breakdown. And that is essentially really um, what, what's, what's going on at the, at the moment. The Tory party are having a, what you can essentially, I suppose, call just a complete functional breakdown over this. Not to a point that it's even split, as we saw there, Brexiteers over... Yeah, we should just break international law. And no, we shouldn't break international law because um, we have been a long-standing uh, nation-state that has stood for the rule of international law. So this has even broken the Brexiteers. And of course, when this gets to the House of Lords, there is no way this goes through, even if Johnson decides to, to peer up more peers on this. The Lords have made it very clear they are not going to allow this through. It is just an absolute travesty and a farce of a bill it really is and again it, it could be just that johnson wants to try and um and maybe well part of me thinks this is a bit cynical but if the lords do kill the internal market bill johnson might have an excuse to actually try and make moves to get rid of the house of lords and replace it now this is something that is quite a, a populist view in in the UK that we should get rid of the, the House of Lords as it's a non a non uh, elected body and anyone can just be you know uh, raised to peerage and just dispatched to the House of Lords. The point that it's got an incredibly farcical. There are something in the region of like eight hundred Lords and barely half of them actually turn up to vote. Um, and trust me, if if you ever watch um, the House of Commons on, like, BBC Parliament or something like that, the the activity and liveliness of the House of Commons, by contrast, is, is complete in subdued nature to the House of Lords, in which very often you will very often spy a Lord basically just falling asleep because many of the people in there are, like, 80-plus. And, you know, just, they just fall asleep. There's no, there's no better way to put it. Uh, but... Uh, if if this does get killed by the House of um, the House of Lords, Johnson has a majority to, if he wanted to, try and push House of Lords reform through. Uh, could this be uh, a massive plan just to do that? <laughs> Who knows? Um, but it's not beyond the realms of possibility. Like I say, I don't think Johnson would be smart enough to actually come up with this. I think this would be a, a Cummings plan in which he could then mobilise, um, you know, the, the, the grassroots network, just as we saw um, with the with the initial push of the quote, Labour has sided with the EU in not voting with the internal market bill. We might very seldom see things like, the Lords are pro-EU, we need to get rid of them. We could see, very well see something like that. Who knows? But... As always, do hit that like and share button. Uh, if you are new to this channel, uh, we do talk a lot about British politics and, of course, Brexit because, as we always say, the two are completely inseparable and it will be with us for some time to come. Um, and, of course, below are links to my Patreon page as well as a one-off donation link should you like to support the channel that way. And so, with that said, thanks for watching and we'll see you all next time.